the fact is, is that the economy, after it hit its trough, shortly after Obama became president, it started picking up slowly. But we had a massive uh, recovery period, which uh, mm-hmm. which followed into Trump. But it doesn't seem that material conditions necessarily are what are really dictating the kind of vibe of the country or the mm-hmm. vibe of particular generations. Absolutely. So, I mean, this this is one of the questions that uh, I spent a lot of time on in the book. I spent a lot of time thinking about because it's a real mystery. The economy started to do a lot better after, especially after about 2011. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a turning point and just it just roared back. You know, the stock market came back. Unemployment went very, very low. If you look at unemployment, say, right before COVID, it's extremely low. Things were going very, very well. Median incomes were, were going up. Um, yet that didn't really reflect the mood in the country. Right. Now, some of that, as you mentioned, politics is because of Trump. And that had some, you know, I think most people would agree, a fairly negative impact on the national yeah. conversation and the and uh, how divisive. But it's, it's also kind of the fact that he was possible you know, reflected right, massive, right. What's, you yeah, know, like, Hey, what like what? what, yeah, you know, yeah. absolutely. And so I, you know, I think, and I think you have to, you have to look at that closely. Mm-hmm. And, um, there were a few things that I found in doing the analyses for the book that I think it, it go a long way toward explaining the rise of, of, of Trump and populism in, in general. Um, so one example is it used to be that, and you looked at say depression and happiness. Mm-hmm. And if you looked at it by social class, education, income, um, occupational prestige, things like this for the silent generation, for example, there really wasn't a whole lot of difference for happiness and mental health, depending on social class. And then that started to change. So mm-hmm. I gra- I have a lot of graphs in the book. Um, yep. and those lines diverge, they diverge mm-hmm. starting with the boomers and then go from there where, in more recent years, you end up with a very big gap for happiness and depression by education level and income. So people with a college education, for example, happiness has stayed fairly stable, levels of depression fairly stable um, among older people anyway. And then lower income, those who don't have a college education, big increases. So this these diverging lines it really suggests that for this segment of the country, um, working class, let's call them, huge amounts of dissatisfaction. And that explains Trump in a lot of ways. Um, Can I, just to uh, linger on this a little bit, you also point out something that's really fascinating that, you know, and and, uh, well, as as to backfill a little bit, and you know, I'm I'm genuinely obsessed with these kind of generational issues because, my parents were born in 1923 and 1927. So technically, in your schema, one is greatest generation, one is uh, silent generation. But they are so, in my mind, so clearly part of the same generation um, in the experiences that they had, the attitudes that they formed. And, and you know, so many different things go into that. But one of the things that is fascinating to me is that you show that it's really the baby boom generation when depression kicks in or when yes. when this kind of existential i i prefer to think mm-hmm. of it as existential angst that's when it kicked in my parents were not happy people they were not wealthy people they were not educated people um but they kind of expected life to suck they would talk often <laughs> about how you know so they were born to immigrant families uh in the 20s then the depression you know and they were dealing with a bunch of shit mm-hmm. then then the depression mm-hmm. hit then world war ii my father yeah. served in world war ii at the end of the war, after you know, even after uh, VJ Day, he and my mother said, "Well, we just we were glad the war was over, but we just expected our lives to be a flat line of kind of pretty shitty, a little bit better than subsistence level existence, but not much because their entire life had been kind of flat economically, and then so something changed, you know." Do you yeah, think Liz? that? Do you think that? this is actually a change in like you know the prevalence of of this sort of existential angst the prevalence of depression things like that or just a change in our our cultural language around it 
We knew well, for sure. I, that and that's I don't know. I don't have a strong yeah, thing it's, there. That's, but. Yeah. And sorry to, to jump yeah. in, but no, no, go um, yeah, we, we know for sure that that isn't it because you also see the same trends in things like suicide mm -hmm. and self-harm and so on. Uh, and they, the, the trends for uh, those objectively measured behaviors are almost exactly the same as the trends in say reports of symptoms. Um, and that's what, that's what, when we're talking about these things, it, it's not based on diagnoses. It's not based on people be, mm -hmm. being more willing to talk about things publicly. It's anonymous surveys about symptoms, which much pe most people don't even know are depression mm -hmm. and these objectively measured behaviors. But um, the, but the rise in the, I mean, the boomers among all the other firsts that they either were or lay claim to is they're the first massively unhappy cohort, right? Yes. And then yes. Gen X also not great, a little bit better. Gen I guess, X was than, kind of flat, you know, I mean, yeah. so early on in their teen years, the, the suicide rate was way up for, for Gen X, but there may be other reasons right. for that. Um, because that's that the that's one of the few places where the, right. the suicide statistics kind of diverge from some of the depression ones. But yeah, I mean, it's if you look across all the generations, it's kind of a complex picture for the trends in mental health. Um, the silent generation actually had better mental health than the greatest right. generation before them, maybe because mm -hmm. they they didn't fight in World War Two, didn't and didn't have the huge impact of the Great Depression. Uh, and then for boomers, it gets significantly worse. Yeah. much more depression and and un unhappiness and suicide rates go up uh gen x kind of stays the course right i um, mean a couple a couple surveys even looks a little better at least as adults um when they were younger not so much a lot of unhappiness right. um and then millennials very mixed picture for millennials for mental health um as young people uh, a lot of things improved actually happiness actually went up among mm -hmm. teens um depression went down by a little bit but the, as adults not so much depression starts to increase right. again and then for gen z that is a place where we have extremely consistent data across pretty much every survey and indicator that mental health got a lot worse for teens and young adults starting around 2012. yeah see um, I'm, I'm i'm skeptical yeah. though like what if what if earlier generations i mean they were dealing with the same level of mental health issues they just dealt with it in different ways because you know there is there's some evidence that things like you know, attention to suicides can increase people's, you know, propensity to think that is the solution. Whereas, you know, maybe you're depressed, you're depressed, like 30 something or 40 something in the 1930s, and you just like quietly drink yourself to death, instead of necessarily, you know, taking your own life. Like, I, I don't know, I, I don't that, think it necessarily were, different suicide rates. I think if that were true, you would see a linear trend, and it's not a linear trend, it goes yeah. in and out. So the silent generation actually have better mental health than the greatest before them. Right. from the data that but, it, got. but it is you wouldn't expect that curve if it was just oh the older generations are more stoic or something but it was a curve there is something odd going on where as america kind of like kicks free of material uh poverty or, or misery after world war ii where everybody you know and there's there's disparities in wealth but like the baseline most people have housing you know clothing shelter some level or access to education and dissatisfaction with life goes up. I mean, it almost right. to me, right. it seems that it's you know we have succeeded you know far beyond Abraham Maslow's greatest uh, dreams mm -hmm. of right. bumping up the hierarchy of needs. And it's like, oh yeah, the one thing that you need to do then is also invent meaning and significance mm -hmm. on a daily basis. I mean, we're all existentialists, right. and we're living in a world where all of those institutions that kind of channeled our energy or restricted our choices. Have started to fade because Gene, one of uh, one of the I think great themes in your book is about, and this you know goes back to at least the beginning of the Industrial Revolution or of the modern period, modernity, um, that people are more individualistic, uh, people mm -hmm. have more choices, and you know, I hate to you know quote Spider Man, but you know with great uh, with great power comes great responsibility, right? Like we're all left having to make sense of our lives at a mm -hmm. time when all the institutions that either did that for us or told us shut up don't do don't think just follow tradition they're mm -hmm. all kind of missing right yeah i mean this this began with the boomers and this is the yeah. dilemma that's still with us today that was an excerpt from my interview with liz nolan brown of reason and gene twangy author most recently of generations if you want to see another excerpt go here and if you want to see the full conversation go here and make sure to come back every Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time 
when reason is talking to people with something very interesting to say that you definitely want to hear.